What's your pleasure, sir? The box? It was always yours. Okay. But uh, before I give it to you, let's talk. Okay. I must quiz you in a way. Okay. What do you know of this box per se? Um, I remember a while back, like some some guy I know, Frank. He had possession of it. Yes, but do you not know that this box is from a movie also? I believe so. Hellraiser, isn't it? Made on the life of Frank Cotton and the illusions of the Order of the Gash themselves, the Cinnabites. I see. Besides that, what do you know of, say, the book as a whole? What are some facts you might know? Tell uh, me them, and I will consider giving it to you. Well, I've learned that in the book, like in Frank Cotton was... He didn't, like, seduce... The uh, Julia character, right? The, yeah, the stepmother, but instead he raped her. Yeah, it's described in a way that makes it sound like having the bitterness of rape or something like that. Well, and he, and instead of blood, and instead of blood that was found on the floor, it was his <clears throat> blessings. Oh man, it's a review of Ichi all over again. Yeah, apparently, folks, if you look it up, he essentially to curve the stimuli he was receiving from the box, he pulled it out for the whole world to see and left something there to on the floor. Hmm. And strangely enough, with the Hellbound Heart, this isn't actually the first time we saw Leatherface also. Oh, Pinhead, actually. Sorry, I get our serial killers mixed up sometimes. Okay. Now we see Pinhead in the book, but did you know the first time we saw him was actually in 1973? Really? Yes, it was a play written by Clive Barker called Hunters in the Snow, actually. Now in the play, there's this character called the Dutchman. Who is essentially a, who is essentially an undead torturer, actually. Now, weirdly enough, this undead torturer in the first play um, versions they had, guess who played him? Doug Bradley. Exactly, Doug Bradley played him, and so when the movie was made, it was only natural for Clive to call him up again to have him play the character. Although ironically, he didn't want to play Pinhead at first. Let me guess, he wanted to play as one of the moving guys? Yes, he did, which is kind of weird when you think about it. It's like a five-minute scene, and it doesn't really go anywhere for the character. Hmm. But I'm glad he did. He brings a very Shakespearean eloquence to his character. Yeah, and he wasn't credited as Pinhead. He was credited as Lead Cenobite, right? Which is fair, but originally he wasn't even going to be called that. He was going to be called the Priest. Which, if you look the way he's dressed, it kind of has got a priest-looking thing going yeah. on. But those became more apparent later in the sequels, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's Clive Barker. You know it's going to be pretty weird. Okay. It's so weird, in fact, you could get Stephen King to say it's going to be the next best thing on the DVD box cover or something like that. Oh, there you go. Yes. And the biggest difference between, the, well, Pinhead in the movie and The Hellbound Heart, the book that he first appeared in, Pinhead's not a man. A he's woman. a woman. Or at least he's described as being a feminine creature with the voice of an excited little girl, if I'm not mistaken. Which is an interesting thing. I've always wondered, why didn't they do that? It would have been so refreshing to see a female boogeyman, maybe. But... It was the 80s, and back then it was dictated that every single horror movie boogeyman had to be a man in some way. Yeah. Not to mention, this just came out a year after, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, so... But, we do get to see Pinhead as a female in the comic books, at least. And oh. she looks fantastic, I will admit. There you go. 
And we get to at least have Doug Bradley's most sumptuous voice do the character. Please, no tears. It's a waste of good suffering. I was like, the box. You came for it. I mean, the box. You opened it. We came. And let's not forget the most important line. We'll, we'll tear, tear your soul apart. apart. He says it with such a great gravitas in his voice. It almost makes him sound like he's sort of in the middle of whispering, but gargling it at the same time. But that's not the only big difference also. Something I've always noticed. The book never really says where it is, first of all. Where in the movie, even though it's supposed to be somewhere in America, it's quite clearly set in London, right? Or somewhere in England. Hell, most of the characters sound pretty British if you listen really carefully. Mm -hmm. In fact, this was actually, at the time, one of the most expensive films shot in England at the time. Oh, really? Yes, because, well, Clyde Barker wanted to have control over everything. Because if he was going to direct the film and write it, he wanted to make sure everything went perfectly as planned. Mm -hmm. And I said he really did a really good job of directing. Yeah, he did. The film's got a very dreamlike feel to it, I feel. And the violence is, well, it is over the top, but it's also stylish in this over the topness. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the other characters also. Now, let's talk about Kirsty first of all, right? Yep. No, she's a nice character. I like that she's able to do a lot of things. But there's a big difference in the book also. Kirsty's not Frank's, uh, not Larry's daughter in the book. In fact, she's an old friend of his that was unfortunately shoved to the friend zone many years ago. We've all been there, girl. We've all been there. But, I, again, I like this little new bond they have. With the, the daughter that's concerned for her father kind of mm -hmm. thing. The only thing I don't like about her is her boyfriend, actually. Who didn't do much. Yeah, like, he's there. He doesn't do anything at all. If anything, that homeless Rob Zombie lookalike does more in the movie, really. That's saying something. Exactly. But, I think the reason they changed her to be his daughter is because of this very simple line. Come, Christy. Come to daddy. It would sound a lot more creepier that way. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, let's talk about the two brothers in the film. Larry and Frank. Yeah, like, Larry is like the opposite of Frank. Whereas, F Frank, who... I would possibly imagine being like a Ian Watkins sort of person. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty Ian watkins -y. Actually, ironically enough, uh, the actor who played him, he's also said that this is the thing that got him recognized, actually, this role. Oh, really? Well, back in the time, he was just a local actor in the UK that nobody really knew, but after this, everybody wanted to play this creepy character in every film he wanted to be afterwards. So, yeah. And ironically, with Creepy, I found out something interesting about the actor who plays Larry, actually. What about him? Well, this isn't the first time he's played a creepy character before. Because later when he gets uh, possessed by Frank, you know, Frank is taking the skin and everything, he gets a little creepy. Yep. Ironically, it reminded me of another role he did. Dirty Harry. As Scorpio? S yeah, Scorpio. The sort of Zodio, Zodiac kind of type char character. And he gets to shine a lot more with his acting around that time. Oh. There you go. Including the time where he gets pulled apart and he says his final words in defiance. Jesus wept. Originally he was going to say fuck off and... Eh, probably best to go a little more <coughs> political way. But also, let's talk about Julia now. Now she's an interesting character in my opinion. She has this sort of... Uh, sort of frigid persona, but that's because she's been bored for her life so many years now, ever since Frank left her. And now that he's back, it's kind of like that same rush she had before is returning to her slowly. Yeah. To where she sort of loses her moral compass almost completely. Mm -hmm. Because she doesn't really seem to want to be with Frank at first, because, well, as we saw in the book, their relationship was not really consensual. Yeah. I mean, in the movie, it's kind of consensual, but he kind of just left her also. But besides that, let's talk about my favorite thing about the movie, the effects. Ooh, they're top-notch. My favorite effect is the scene where we get to see Frank's body come back to life. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know what, I don't know how long it took them to get that right, but 
whatever it did, all that time and all that work, it clearly paid off in the end. Mm -hmm. And who did the effects for that, actually? I don't know. Was it Rick Baker? I think it was Rick Baker. I, I think... I doubt it. Well, whoever did it, he should be proud of himself because it's got a very... When I was watching it, it kind of reminded me of sort of an early Cronenberg type sort of thing. Especially with the goo and the way his body morphs also. And that scream at the end, it sort of sounded like something from my nightmares. <laughs> but, I don't know. The film also has another weird thing. It kind of subverts actually a horror trope of some sort. What's that? It actually has something to do with the, the box, box, actually. At the end when uh, Frank is taken care of and we see the Cinnabites return, right? Yep. Now, originally, with horror villains, they usually the bad guys to be defeated with a pretty phallic looking object, right? Mm -hmm. A gun, a knife, a long pointy thing. Mm -hmm. But instead, we actually get the opposite of phallic, a yonic symbol. The box itself. She essentially closes off the box away from the intruders. I'm not reading into much of this, am I? I don't think you are. Thank goodness, I thought I was going crazy. But besides that, let's also talk about the creme de the creme themselves, the Cenobites, actually. Ugh, Chatterer freaks me out. Is that your scariest one? Yeah. Which is strange, because we have a female there, and I was wondering, was she originally supposed to be the lead one? I... But she doesn't get too much lines, actually. No. I think she only had, like, a few lines, but I couldn't hear them well because she whispers them half the time. Mm. And then we have the big lardy one, which... Butterball, is it? <laughs> Butterball. I, is it me, or those should be the new names of a Tim Hortons flavor? Butterball and Chatterer. Butterball and Chatterer. We should make a TV show based on that. Our new Nickelodeon thing. Could be the new Ren and Stimpy, you never know. Yeah. Well, besides that, what would, what would your last thoughts of the movie be? I think it's a fun horror movie. Like, is it perfect? No, but it's very iconic has an iconic character and all that. An iconic character, the effects are beautiful in it. Mm -hmm. And for a first time director, Clive Barker does a really good job with it. Yeah, he should have directed more movies. But unfortunately, the rights for the movie were taken away from him. Yeah. And now he claims that the new movies don't have any co anything in common with him. Not even his butthole. Mm. I'm no seriously folks, look up his post, funniest things you'll ever see. But. He talked to great length. Now, I must ask you, are you ready for it? I believe so. I must warn you, this box contains so much. And I must warn you, when I give it to you, there's no going back. Well, I'm actually going to use this as a gift to a, an enemy of mine, but okay. I suggest you check it out first before anything else. Yeah, just in case it... Doesn't work. Well, ta ta. Yeah. Alright, let's see if this works. 